as usual, I'm going to show you briefly the plans for this week. And then I want to devote the rest of the class to two or possibly three things. And the two things I want to do for sure are to explain, analyze some passages from a motor car divorce, possibly work together with you on the analysis of additional passages to see how you fare, how you manage with the conclusion of the book. If there is time, I want to go back to the examples that we analyzed to understand the format and methodology of the final project and complete that work. If we cannot do it today, of course, we're going to do it on Thursday. So this is week 10. And uh, the presentation you find here is the same that I used last week, where you have uh, an outline of the main themes and ideas in this 1906 motor romance. The film for this week will be a 1971 odd film by French director, actor, Oscar winner Jacques Tati called Traffic. And I've picked this film to follow on the silent movies that we watched because this film is also almost silent, not much dialogue going on. You can find it on Prime. You could have found it on Canopy, which is free for Stony Brook students and faculty, but they removed it from the selection this year. There are a few other streaming options, including Apple TV, where you can see the movie if you want to. And I've included the link to the Wikipedia article, although I recommend rather than reading from Wikipedia that you read this article that is taken from the booklet that is uh, distributed together with the Blu-ray and DVD of the film. The assignments have a mixed deadline. The readings are due next week. The written assignment, which is the last one, the week after that. Keep that in mind. So this is going to be our next document about automobile and society. You can call it an instant book, although it is quite extensive to be called such in the English version. It's, I believe, 600 pages. We've I've accepted the most relevant passages. So Luigi Barzini packing to Paris is the chronicle of this endurance race that took place in 1907. Um, and uh, that lasted more than two months from China to France, and Barzini was the journalist on board the winning car, an Italian car named Itala. Itala was the brand. So the written assignment is simple, not much writing. It's more about doing research. So by the ninth, two weeks, from this Wednesday, you have to find some links that could be included in your final project. It's up to you. This is just, again, to practice the work for the final project. If later on you decide that you have better, more exciting, more interesting document for your project, feel free to discard these but show me that you can do some of the preliminary steps in the research for the project. So you go back to the page format and methodology of the final project. You find a list of an extensive list of sources that can be used for this. And you find at least two documents that could be used for your digital catalog. You don't have to then treat them the way uh, you would for the catalog. You just include the bibliographical reference, the link to the document, make sure it's a direct link that takes to that page specifically. 
and then just explain why you think they're interesting and relevant in, in simple terms, right? Uh, you'll be evaluated, most importantly, on the quality of the documents you found. And it is worth 1%. We're done with the written assignments. This is the last one. It's preparation for the final project. Of course, keep in mind that there is an alternative. The final project has an alternative, which, which is to write a paper on relevant topics having to do with the automobile in this 1905 novel by British writer Harris Burland, The Black Motor Car. In that case, you find here the instructions if you're pursuing this alternative, okay? Either way, of course, between now and the deadline, you also have me to assist you. That is to say, this is in preparation for the final project. If you realize that you, you're still not getting it, make an appointment on Zoom or visit me during office hours, and we can work together on this so that you can then uh, be up to speed uh, for the final project and the presentation. Now, if there is time on Thursday, I might be talking also about the final exam, the format and uh, sample questions and giving you tips and suggestions on how to prepare for the final exam. Although that is uh, uh, in the plans for next week, I'll see if we can do it this week. Otherwise, we'll proceed with the plans and do it then. Keep in mind that the page I showed you on Thursday called the first auto 1927 notes and quotes has been completed. I moved here all the relevant links, adding uh, a few more, for example, from IMCDB, the Internet Movie Database for Cars, showing you which cars have been identified from this film. But more importantly, I've added a complete synopsis of the film, okay? Keep in mind that the final exam will include one question about one or more of the films that were shown in class. And this is one way to prepare for it, right? To review pages such as this or the pages I created for Love Bag, Bumblebee, etc. Okay, so this is where we start in the examination of select passages showing the relevant themes in A Motor Car Divorce by Louise Closser Hale. And keep in mind what we said in general about this novel. This is a novel about technology. Of course, the automobile occupies a, a central place in the novel, in the plot itself, to the point where you find also pages about the choice of the car and the process of purchasing the car and testing the car, which is rather unique for the time. However, those pages that you find initially in the first few chapters about the process of selecting the right model, testing it, etc., are indicative of the twist that in this novel is as important as the love story. Right, because you have a love story, the, uh, a wife who wants to divorce from her husband, not because there are issues, only because she wants to be a la mode. She wants to be uh, on the cutting edge of the women's revolution and show that she can be independent. She doesn't want it. Clearly, that's not in her character. And there is a bit of satire, a bit of irony directed at the character of Peggy Ward by the author Louise Closser Hale, evidently because she saw uh, uh, similar profiles in American society around her at the time. But the other aspect is that is central to the novel is consumerism, is the fact that the threatened separation of the couple. And then their decision to stay together also involves 
and no foundation for their marriage and their place in society, which is based on their choice of purchasing an automobile. They're new people in their relationship, not simply because they've decided to stay together, but also because the purchase of the automobile has made them different from the point of view of their social identities. And they stay together, not just as husband and wife, but also as no modern consumerists. And the message of the culture of consumption during this period focuses a lot on the family. And the marketing campaigns after, often during that period and then later on in full blown in a full-blown effort during the 20th century, try to break up the family and reconstitute the family around the act or of purchasing. Purchasing different products, especially those products that allegedly will redefine their identity or will procure them a different lifestyle altogether. So, see for example, what happens here in the second chapter. They're trying to find an automobile, but they cannot decide which one they should buy. They go to agencies, they go out for demo rides, but they're not convinced. And they think this is important, not just because of the amount of money they're committing to this purchase, but because of the alleged consequences on their life. The automobile is to be the means to their divorce. And in fact, the automobile will be the instrument that will keep them together. But this confirms what I was saying, that consumerist culture redefines what they are, even as a couple. So this is Peggy's reflection. I hit upon a splendid plan. So she has an idea on how to proceed about this. Upon several plans, in fact, and all of them without any troublesome riding around in the car, cars themselves. So they don't have to go and be taken for a ride by the vendor, by the salesman from a car agency, which is what happened whenever the customer didn't know, had not learned how to drive the car. One was to buy the cheapest machine and another was to buy the most expensive. But we simply couldn't afford the latter, the most expensive, and the cheapest has such ugly lines. So you see that the automobile is not simply a utilitarian technology because there is an aspect in the design of the car, you're being seen on that car, that defines your public persona the automobile becomes a kind of accessory, both to the fashion profile of the user and also to the social profile of the user altogether. The cheapest has such ugly lines, I could never have gone about in it with any degree of comfort. So you see here how the car itself, the product is scaffolding the identity of the characters. It's supporting the definition of their social persona. In fact, they think about their use of the car and how they will be seen driving that car in Europe, in Italy, and they say that having something elegant gives one the courage to drive good bargains without losing one's self-respect. So they want to go to Europe, they want to go to Italy, and like practically any tourist, American tourist of today, would say they want to buy good things for cheap, right? And they intend to bargain because, of course, they expect Italy to be a pre-capitalistic society where you can uh, negotiate a lower uh, price, whether you go to a restaurant, to a hotel, or to an open air market, but they don't want to be perceived as cheap. That's what losing one's self-respect refers to. They want to be treated 
by others like people of importance. And having the car define how they're perceived in public makes them feel more important, makes them feel different. So it's not their individual qualities that count anymore. It's the way they dress and the products they surround themselves with. And later on, you have interesting examples of this. Now, since they cannot afford the most expensive car and they don't want to be seen in the ugliest, cheapest car, they resort to uh, a, a supernatural decision that is reminiscent of mystical texts and religious texts in general. In fact, this kind of uh, strategy is very reminiscent of what we first read in Western culture in the autobiography of St. Augustine. St. Augustine is about to convert to Christian religion. He's not sure his life is in turmoil and he is in the garden of his house and he hears a voice which might come from the kid playing nearby or might come directly from God and the voice says tolle legge which means pick up read he picks up the bible open it opens it randomly puts the finger on the page and then reads a verse and that verse is particularly illuminating. It becomes the voice of God talking directly to him and uh, guiding him into his decision of converting, truly converting to Christian religion. I took the book away from him, prayed for a sign. Of course, it's, it's ironic. Shut my eyes, turned to pages, described a circle. Oh, the book is, of course, a catalog with different cards, and you find plenty of them during that time, and many of them have survived. Sometimes you even find them in antique bookstores or antique stores altogether. Describe the circle with my finger, put it down on the page, open my eyes, and silent as the stars blinked into my face. Silent as the stars, it was, was the commercial slogan used by a company known as Northern, making cars that were supposedly uh, quieter. Uh, their engine was, was quieter than the engine of other cars. And that is what they end up picking up. So you see, even though there is plenty of irony and almost a satire of religion in this passage, you see how their identity individual and social identities are being shaped by this decision. And in fact, after that, they've made this decision, she doesn't sleep because she thinks now we're one step closer to the divorce because we have the car, next we'll go to Italy, next they'll complete the trip, next they'll go back home and uh, appear in a court of law uh, to justify their separation and their request for a divorce, okay? So keep this in mind. In fact, the car will be what will keep them together, but on a different foundation, on different values, you could say. And so the next day she, she kind of sleep and the next morning uh, she uh, sees John and John was driving by with their new car, which they will call, in fact, the means, meaning the means to uh, their divorce. Of course, being a proto-feminist of sorts, Peggy doesn't appreciate the fact that inside the uh, commercial ad of the car, they say it's so simple a woman can run it, which is the kind of language you would have found often you would find often if you look for these commercials and she says no this, this is an insult to my sex right in this novel as well as you found in the lightning conductor the idea is that the technology 
eliminates the gender gap. Women can drive as well as men once they learn how to operate the car. However, she explains that the sentence, the passage that she found insulting to uh, her gender is also justified by the fact that this kind of uh, car doesn't have too many levers to operate. So one doesn't have to keep his hands going like a xylophone player in the orchestra. And while his feet will have some quick stepping to do, it's really nothing. So there is an easier uh, interface compared to other cars. Okay. And notice that she remarks how this might never have happened had I not met and married John. So you see how their marriage is being redefined by this purchase, right? Now she's in a marriage where there is an automobile, which defines them as a new and modern couple. And later on, in the same chapter, she identifies herself as the car. She feels like a 30 horsepower silent as the stars, shut up in a whole bedroom. Meaning she wants to go. She wants to go and be free. Also notice how, as you've seen in the lightning conductor, the man in the couple becomes more appealing because he can operate a car, he's skillful. The spelling is correct, of course, the spelling uh, that uh, is found in the original text. Don't worry about that. I told you how they, John and Peg, uh, encounter a series of odd characters on their ship to Europe, to Naples, and they will keep in contact with some of them, Douglas, Miss Gray, Miss, Mrs. Baring, uh, will reappear regularly on the pages of the novel. And in fact, uh, Mrs. Baring will play a pivotal role as the possible woman in the life of John after, she, after he gets a divorce. The reason being that they're both car nuts. Whereas Douglas and Miss Gray are more on the side of Peg, they're not technological. They're not evolved from that point of view. Uh, Douglas Warwick is an artist. As an artist, he doesn't care about uh, the, the, the small details of life, from getting dressed to eating, uh, to taking care of himself, or even uh, realizing when his pipe is out or when he is sitting on his hat. However, everybody looks after him. I don't know why, just as John looks after me. So Douglas, by virtue of passages such as this, is defined as a non-leader, right? And in the category of leaders, instead, you find John and Mrs. Baring, who take the lead through the novel on different actions, whereas Douglas, uh, Miss Gray, and Peg herself uh, are often just following or reacting to what John does, to what Mrs. Baring does, etc. And how is Mrs. Baring defined? I already uh, mentioned this profile. She's been described here as the ideal 19th century woman, the ideal uh, model uh, for uh, a female companion uh, that you would have found in books about marriages at the end of the 19th century, when many, in, in many countries from the US to France to uh, England and Italy, had publications where intellectuals and more often doctors talked about marriage from a medical point of view, from a biological or scientific point of view, and from a social point of view, meaning that for a society altogether, it would be good practice to have certain kinds of people get married at a certain age and have kids, etc. 
So she has that physique that we can call pre-modern. She's large, finely built, she's robust, very glistening, very polished, very clean, shiny hair, well scrubbed skin, white teeth that flash when she smiles, not tigerishly, she's not excessively aggressive, but in a friendly way. And of course, this is the opposite of the kind of woman that Peg is described as. She's worried, Peg is worried, because she sees how John reacts to a woman such as Mrs. Baring. He says he glows with pride when he sees an American woman with the strength, physical strength, and the determination to start her own engine just as if that muscular, muscular attribute was the crowning glory to a sanctified life. So she's the perfect moral wife, she's the perfect physical wife, and now she's also developed this technological side, so she seems almost perfect compared to Peg, the perfect match for uh, John. During their trip to Italy, you find many descriptions of the tourist spots that they visit, John and Peg, and notice how even the experience of the trip to Italy, of the journey, helps define them. It's not that they are trying to learn about the places, know more about the people in those places. Those places simply become the background to emphasize or to amplify their identity. So this would be a typical example, which is why I included it there uh, in Naples and, uh, or, or near Naples. And it's dinner time, it's the end of the day. Uh, Peg is on a terrace overlooking the town and the sea. She can see the Vesuvius and everything is perfectly romantic. Everything is postcard perfect. And of course, you also find the, all the tropes about Italians who are singing, but we saw that. Uh, well, no, you, you didn't. I, I spoke too soon. I saw that um, when I was teaching another class last semester about Machiavelli and we watched the talented Mr. Ripley with Jude Law. And when um, Matt Damon uh, arrives in the small village in Campania where uh, Jude Law is hiding with his lover, hiding from his wealthy family who would like to have him back to run their business in Naples, the moment he steps out of the bus, people are singing, right? Typical, right? You get to Italy, you get off the plane and people are singing. Now, they're Italians, so they're poets, they're singers. At best, they're, they're cooking, right? So this is supper and singing together. Everything is perfect, but everything is being treated like background. Meaning, it's not the reflection of someone who says how exciting this place is, but rather how this is perfect for me. And in fact, the conclusion of this is the reflection that she should not be working as a typewriter. She had already contemplated various options for her job after uh, they split John and Peggy and she, she needs to find a job. So she thought, I'll be a typewriter because uh, learning how to type on a typewriter and then working as a secretary was seen as the typical middle income or lower middle income job for women during that period. But she says, no, uh, I, I cannot be a typewriter or a secretary. I need to be an actress, right? Because look at me, this is like a theater. This is theater uh, uh, around me, the theater of life. And to make this postcard stereotypically romantic view of Italy perfect or complete, you even have a little bit of tragedy, which is very operatic. And uh, the, the story goes like this. They make friends with Francesco because they visit Capri several times. Capri is not too far from the shores of Naples or the Amalfi Coast. And whenever they go to Capri, Capri is a very steep island. They use a horse and carriage to go from the port 
where they land with a ferry or another boat uh, to the various places in Capri they want to visit. So they make friends with Francesco. Francesco uh, is, is th then one day found uh, dead. They, they hear he was murdered. And of course, being in Italy, it was about a woman because he had uh, initiated uh, uh, not, not a real relationship or an affair, but certainly a friendship with a local woman, although Francesco is married and his wife in Naples uh, gets hold of his illicit contacts with this woman who is not married, and she sends some facchini, some porters, um, uh, of course, in, in a city such as Naples, like any major European city during that time, you would have found plenty of people working as porters, especially in a, in a city with a lot of commercial activities. The porters uh, come there in numbers, there's five or six of them against poor Francesco, they stab him to death, and to make this more tragic and more operatic, he uh, crawls uh, asking for help. They send a priest to him. He can render a final confession and he forgives his enemies. And, and the poor horse that was probably uh, his best friend uh, remains alone and that is followed by a funeral and John and Peg participate in the funeral. Peg even says that uh, she's the only woman besides an old woman uh, because Italians don't allow women to participate in the funeral, which, which is folly. Uh, even for this period, um, you might have found during this period small villages where women and men participate in a funeral in different groups during a procession, rather than being uh, walking behind the coffin together. But, but of course, women participated in a funeral. It just makes it more ethnic, right? And keep in mind what we said about their journey being the journey from a very primitive south to an un industrialized and more advanced, more progressive north, which is reflective also of their own individual journey from being pre-technological to being technological, a technological couple, a couple with a car. There are many passages where they describe the effects of the car on their nervous system. It's not just the emotions, it, it is how the car takes hold of them and changes their mood, their attitude entirely. For example, uh, John and I could still laugh wonderfully, meaning even though we're about to divorce, we're still happy and ecstatically happy. Whenever we were in motion, so, Driving at speed read is what redefines you, is this new dimension to life that didn't exist before. Whenever we were in motion, we would become deliriously happy. Immediately forget past difficulties and the possibility of future ones and just love everybody. John says this is called automobile elation. And again, it's something you find in a lot of texts from this period, the description of this feeling uh, induced by the automobile, all motorists have the sensation. So that's how we can say that the automobile is a new kind of technology, because it is not being used by the user for a purpose. It's the technology itself that changes the user and makes them different individuals. And of course, she uh, attributes that to the air that comes uh, to you very quickly when you're driving. So this is just to underline, to emphasize that it is a physical effect, right? That is pre-rational. It's something that escapes the rational control by the people using the car. <coughs> like in many other texts from the period, you find different uh, references to what we might define as road rage in a few words, the idea that if you're in the car, your level of empathy towards people around you changes greatly and goes down. And that's how uh, you may have the extreme manifestation of this as uh, road rage, right? In this case, they are talking about kids in Naples 
playing a game, throwing a jacket or a hat in front of the car and screaming so that the driver would see this item of clothing fly, hear the scream, and they would think they have ran over a small kid. Keep in mind that in most cars, the driver and the passenger are sitting high, very high, uh, higher on the road than you would be today. So your visibility right in front of you is limited. And to follow this, if the driver hits the brakes, steps out of the car, go and check, the kids are laughing. If the driver continues, they laugh anyway, even though the uh, items of clothing might get ruined. And this is Peg's reaction, the ironic rendition of this idea of road rage. At first I feared we would kill one of these little boys because it is still dangerous to throw something in front of the car. Now I fear we won't, meaning I want to crash them. I, I want to kill those little um, kids playing these games. You find the description. Not only do you find the automobile elation, you find also the automobile face. And again, this is ironic though, the automobile face is supposed to be the face that John makes trying to hide the fact that the automobile is about to break down, that there is a problem, because John has, in general, a lot of confidence in the car, uh, and, and the car instead fails them constantly. The manifestation of the limited reliability of the car comes ironically from this particular episode where they're stopped by a brigand. Again, stereotypically, you would expect to find brigands in a story about Southern Italy. It was indeed a phenomenon that occurred in Italy in, south, in the south and the north of Italy through the 19th century. Still in the middle of the 19th century, you would have find, found bands, groups of uh, uh, brigands, uh, not only uh, uh, stealing from people on the road, but becoming famous for some uh, bigger operations. For example, in northern Italy, uh, once they, uh, a, a group uh, of, of such criminals uh, sequestered all the wealthier people of the town in the theater. They went to the theater when there was a show and uh, they, they had all the um, wealthy spectators in there sequestered and then one per family, they would ask a representative of each family to accompany them one at a time to their house to deliver to these criminals their more precious belonging. And when they're done, they left the, the town. This occurred to the family of Pellegrino Artusi, who's the father of modern Italian cuisine, whose book about Italian cuisine uh, relaunched Italian cuisine uh, at the end of the 19th century. So even Peg and John must find a brigand, a street thief on, in, in front of them. And instead of offering them what they have to have their lives spared, they say, take the car, just leave us alone, but take the car. So you'll be happy, but we'll be happier and the criminal himself says, no, 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 no. I know these things, they never work. I couldn't use them for uh, my criminal activities because they're too noisy. And if I took one home to my cave, because I've been a Greek brigand, he lives in a cave, my wife would complain about the smell of the car. So it's another ironic take on the uh, unreliability of cars from the period. The brigand, however, being very Italian, is cautious enough to escort them to a place um, where they can have their car repaired. And in this place, there is an exchange, there is an encounter between Peg and a local young woman, a young peasant, uh, that is, once again, a good kind of evidence for the theme that I alluded to earlier the idea that your 
identity, your social identity is being defined by the product you have on you. In this case, fashion. So this is the encounter between these two women, the wealthy American and the young female peasant. Peggy says, no queen could have been more gently handled. So she's been treated like a queen. Why? Because they've gotten to know each other? No, it's just because she dressed elegantly. So my hat was removed and admired. So the young female peasant is taking these things, but not just putting them away, but ex expressing her, her admiration for the uh, uh, clothes and the accessories worn by Peg. And, and this makes Peg, of course, feel a more powerful individual. My coat shaken out and adored with careful hands. I was fingered from neck chain and rings to the ruffle of my petticoat, a petticoat of silk. She fell on her knees, giving little cries of rapture and rustled the silk between her fingers. How every woman loves that sound, etc. Okay, so the whole identity of Peg is being supported by the admiration that she receives from this woman. And at the end of this episode, she will give a, a, a petticoat of silk to this woman and she will comment that, of course, it's an item of clothing that is out of place with someone from such a low position in life, but the ecstasy, again, this is the spelling that was sometimes used in the 19th century, the ecstasy in her eyes, so the pleasure she gets from this, right? So even peasants defined by their identity by the articles of clothing they can have. This is another story uh, where Peg and John go to a restaurant while their car is being fixed. And this man is, the, the man running the restaurant and the inn is the brother of another local who helped them find the spare parts for their car. And they play a prank on this poor man and the other locals by showing a picture of a church with a tower in New Heaven and telling them this is our house. And it's not even the biggest that you find in the area where we live. So they're pretending to be much more important. This is another indication of the theme that I mentioned last week, that they live this experience on the road as if rules did not apply to them. And in fact, if you consider the genre of road movies, this is one of the pillars of the narrative in most uh, road movies, that being on the road and being away from your local community where people know you, you are able to build an identity, create a new identity, or pretend to be someone that you are not. And, and you have that um, happen to these characters as well. The car is being treated like a person, is being personified, right? It's being treated like a sentient creature. For example, in here, our motor car had different plans. The car had different plans, meaning the car doesn't want to take them to their destination. We were the whole blessed day teasing it as far as that place, try, trying to get the car to be convinced to get them to their destination for that day. They're, they're proceeding in stages in their journey. We got very well acquainted with the machine and now and then could grasp a few motor words between its pantings and gurglings. Twice, I'm sure, it said, what's your hurry? And once, John caught it muttering something about, treat me right and I'll treat you right. Tell us what you want, said John persuasively. Do you want more gasoline? No answer. Don't you like that nice new oil in the cylinders? Not a sound. John himself was sure it was a leaky valve. And of course, the car will break down. But even though it's ironic, it is part of the process of the symbiotic relationship with technologies that 
consumers personify some of the technology. For cars, this has been going on through the 20th century. And you may have experienced that yourself, maybe with grandparents talking to the car. If they, if they have an older car that didn't work all the time, they were trying to talk the car into starting or into uh, taking uh, all of you to destination. What's important is also how people react to the technology in the story. This is a relevant passage for that. So first of all, traveling by car called touring a country was seen as a different experience, a different way to interact with the landscape and the people. One is so much nearer the country and the people traveling by the roads. This, of course, compared to the train. The train typifies only the means to an end, meaning takes you from point A to point B, and you cannot really appreciate the landscape. We look out of the car windows and are aliens to those we pass by. In a motor, while we're great people to the peasant, we're among them. So they're great people, meaning they're wealthy. Clearly, the peasants can see that they're traveling in a car, and therefore, they're from a different social class. But they're still immersed in the social, as much as the natural landscape, by touring in a car. And then they describe how the people react, uh, almost with mystical admiration. And you find many such descriptions in the uh, literature from the period, how uh, men, women, little boys, old women, you have an anthropological representation, a sample of the whole society, old women, old men, uh, and, and of course, notice how old men have rings in their ears and hats in hand. Uh, Southern Italians didn't have rings in their ears, typically, it would have been unusual even in the 19th century, okay? So it's just part of the super ethnic representation of Southern Italy. And of course, the last remark is how this is supporting their identity. Okay, so, I've been awfully quiet, almost depressed, on the verge of falling asleep, and I care about you so much that we'll continue with something different where you have a more active role. I'll stop here as far as the um, introduction of themes through passages, and I'll invite you individually, or if you want to, in group of two, um, but if you do so, please include the name of the other person in the notes, to click on the last series of excerpts from a motor car divorce, where one that says chapters 16 through 20. And in there, with reference to two of those chapters, chapter 16 and chapter 20 only, only for the first and the last chapter in this series, go look for passages that are relevant to the theme of technology, to the theme of how the use of the technology redefines, reshapes the identity of the characters. It's easy. You even have some passages that I highlighted but there are many more passages you can find. You don't have to limit yourself to those. And certainly try to get the feeling of a context for those passages as well. Leave some notes in the Google Docs file where you do the assignments. But based on those notes, we can, before the end of this class, exchange a few ideas uh, and have a short discussion so that I can hear at least from some of you and for the others I'll read the notes when I open your files. By the way I'm more than halfway through the review of the files with the assignments, the participation notes and everything I'm trying to continue as fast as I can. Okay so find this the chapters 16, 16 through 20 from a motor car divorce focus on the pages you find in here from page six, from chapter 16 and chapter 20. Keep in mind, uh, just to understand what is going on, in chapter 16, John and Peggy are approaching Turin. 
and from there they will continue to the mountains. They went to Turin. They were not. They were on a different itinerary, a more touristic itinerary. They were traveling through the shores, the coast of Liguria, past Genoa, in the direction of San Remo, all the uh, places that tourists from the time wanted to visit before seeing the French Riviera. But at some point, John says, enough, these places are one after the other, they're the same, uh, and they deviate from the coast, they go uh, inland in the direction of Turin in Piedmont. From there, they will go to the Alps, not to see the Alps, but to see a race, a hill climb race. Hill climbs are typical races of the period. Then they will move to France. Keep in mind also what is going on in their lives. Besides the idea of the divorce, Peggy initially wanted to get off the automobile in Genoa and take a boat and uh, go take a ship and go back uh, to the US by herself because she's convinced at this point that she doesn't want the divorce anymore. She wants to keep John by herself for herself. She's afraid that John instead wants the divorce very much so that she can remarry the widow Mrs. Perry because she appears to be a better match for him. Physically stronger woman, right? better for social hygiene, for producing kids, and technologically, because she's so familiar with the technology of the automobile. Finally, the other thing that is mentioned here and there in these pages, there is another couple they met during their trip, a young couple. And this couple, a bachelor and a woman who's not married, is escaped. So that they, they left and, and went away without their family's authorization. And they're stopping at different places, saying that they're married and using John and Peg's names to sign up in the records of the hotel as customers. Because of this, the woman, the young woman's father is trying to have Peg and John stopped, arrested, so that he can uh, take his daughter away and have the man sent to jail for, for kidnapping his daughter. So this will give you uh, some of the minor references you find in here. Look at chapter 16, look at chapter 20, find, first of all, significant passages, and then include short quotes or page numbers and provide some comments on the significance of these passages for the development of the themes and ideas in this novel. While you're working on this, if you feel comfortable, you can raise your hand and uh, I'll come to your place, to your seat, and answer any questions you may have, okay? Okay, it's all right if you haven't uh, found much, it's just, an exercise to get familiar with the process of identifying passages, commenting on them, which is similar to what you'll be called to do for the final exam, because during the final exam, besides the essay questions, the text of the essay questions, giving you uh, some ideas of what you should be writing about or the kind of examples you can include, you will also find a, a packet with a selection of readings applicable to the questions themselves. So you will have, if the question focuses on this novel, of course you won't have all of the pages, but you'll have a selection of passages where examples may be found, and you can expand and include more, but you have a text in front of you to support your analysis, and therefore the work you'll be doing that day is similar to what we're trying to do now. As we did, for a similar activity about Jules Verne, the master of the world, when you raise your hand to say something, uh, allow me with page numbers or quotes to find the passage you want to comment on so that I can put it on the screen for everyone to see, and then we'll hear first the comments of the person who pointed out to that passage and anyone else who wants to add something. Who would like to start? Dave. What should I put on the screen? So it's in chapter 20, at the end of page 
311. Okay, let me find that. Yeah, that one right there. So it's the whole passage where it says stop, no, I won't stop. Mm -hmm. uh, that whole passage basically just shows how I think it's Peggy who's driving the car um, while John is in the back seat with an injury. And an Actually, and, and I'm guilty because I once said that, but she didn't have John in her back seat. After John fell, she left it there because she didn't want to move it. You know how even today they repeat if someone is hurt, uh, especially their heart, their, their head, their back, not to move them without medical uh, or paramedic there to, uh, to do that. She leaves John on the ground and drives back to find the doctor and then drives back with the doctor to take him to the hospital. So she's alone in the car, right? Yeah. But what are the conflicting emotions that are transferred into this passage? So in that passage, like at first you can see how Peggy is scared. Um, she's mm -hmm. going at a high rate of speed. Even she admits that she doesn't even know how to stop. Mm -hmm. um, and, but towards the middle of the passage, you see where she says, well, I don't like it, don't I? Now the truth Kevin helped me, yes, I am enjoying it. She shows how like going at that fast speed, driving alone by herself, just like gives her this like immediate sort of like power. It's it's not really like she says that it's not happiness that she feels because she's still worried about John. And she she, her, she, she knows she's not supposed to be excited, feel but, happy, etc., but she does. Yeah, she, so what what this passage shows is how overpowering the experience is. Right? And what we said before about the experience of the technology being pre-rational, beyond the full control of the user, is manifested by passages such as this. She's supposed to feel sad because she might lose John, and John at this point is, again, the love of her life, not someone she wants to divorce from. Yet, driving the car is much more than any romantic feeling she may have or any tragic emotion she might feel, right? So this is absolutely relevant. It's one of the key passages in the whole novel. The fact that she cannot help but feeling excited, exhilarated, elated, etc. Anyone else who would like to add to this passage or any point out any details in the passage? Okay, let's look at another passage. What else? Oh, yes? I was reading the beginning chapter of this page and it looked like she was like getting really like... That Speak up because I, I have the, the noise okay. of the fan so I cannot hear you over that. Yeah. Where, where should I go first of all? Which page? Or just scrolling is sufficient? Uh, yeah, I think scrolling is just sufficient for this one because I'm doing, I've looked at chapter 16. Um, was that not the one we were supposed to look at? Sorry? Was that not the chapter we were supposed to look at? Which one? It's all right, uh, however. Okay. Um, yeah, with chapter 16, while I was reading um, Peggy and John's interactions, it felt like John had like, everything he knew about what the car was like and Peggy was just like not really brushing it off but not really acknowledging mm -hmm. like what he was really saying and it felt like she was kind of just sick of him mm -hmm. in a way. and I think that kind of like was building up. Can I see the passage though? I, I haven't identified the passage. Can you give me a page number or a quote yeah. to find it? Like Just give me three words to find it, um, if you have it in front of you. It was like 229, and okay. it started with, um, so I answered him. Okay. Yep, I see it. Yeah, it's, uh, it goes from like that whole page from like where I can see it, um, it lands, like it ends right at around like 230. Mm -hmm. So it feels like that whole page is, um, Kind of feels like banterish in a way, like it feels like short. She's talking not to John, right? 
she's talking to a British aristocrat she found in the garage in Turin. Oh. And initially, she didn't know that he was a wealthy, important member of society because he was wearing the mechanics overall. Yeah. The uniform, simply because he's another aficionado of the car and he wants to uh, work on a car himself. Then, uh, at this point, uh, Peg herself has volunteered to come to the garage, work on the car, and uh, however, Peg being Peg, she uh, uses her seductive powers trying to play the part of the weak woman who needs rescuing to have the Englishman, the wealthy, powerful Englishman, come and work on their car himself uh, because he's an expert and, and she's, quote unquote, just a woman, even though at this point she went to work on the car because she feels this uh, desire to uh, uh, be with, with the car, okay? So it's not that She's unhappy with the car or had enough with the car. She's, of course, reacting somewhat negatively to a British man and his mannerisms. Yeah. But at the same time, the overall context is positive and evidence of the stronger relationship of Peg and the car. In fact, at some point, uh, she, they talk about Peg having the motor beam being in her eyes, this spark uh, of enthusiasm in her eyes.